Guys, thanks for doing this. Thank really glad that you're us. here. I'm excited for this show. Uh, it's been a couple weeks in the making here. Uh, as we get started, please introduce yourself. I'll go. My name is Travis Up, and I am the clinical director for Milieu Management here at Cumberland Heights. Um, I have been here for uh, 15 years and two months. I'm also a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. Shout out, long term employee. Long term employee. Been here for a while. Been here for a while. Don't plan on going anywhere. Yep. He doesn't. Uh, and I'm Jeff Wilson. I'm the clinical director for the Young Men's Program and the Extended Care Program at Cumberland Heights. And you've been doing that for a couple months now. Yes. Fresh to it. Pretty fresh. How do you like it? I like it. It's good. It was a goal. It's, it's where I wanted to be, and I'm here. Yeah. So it's exciting. It's fun. It's new. So you two, y'all are pretty good buds. Y'all. Please. He's my best friend. <laughs> Y'all have worked True. together closely at Cumberland Heights for what, five years now? Three years? Four or Six. three? Six. Well, closely. Closely five. Five. Yeah. Five weeks. I mean, we've known yeah. each other. He worked here when I worked here. Yeah, but, but we I didn't get my, close until we came back. He says he has his eye on me, I but had I my, him. He just took that from me. I had my eye on him for a long time. Mm -mm. He was doing four step instruction. I heard a lot about him. And I was like, I'm going to get that dude to come work with us. And this was when you were working for Stillwaters? No. No, so I was the team lead in the men's program, and Heath and Tyson grabbed me to go to Stillwaters. Um, and so I went out there for a couple years. And But before I left, I was encouraged to go back to school. And Stillwaters and school works really well together yeah. um, with four days off. And when I was getting close to my internship in my final semester, um, I saw a posting for a clinical associate in the young men's program, and I called Travis and it was just the most logical who was director at the time was director at the time and i called him and i said i'd like to take a position in the young men's program which is somehow transformed into he picked me um but i definitely think i uh, asked to join the team um, but i think it was a good choice for both of us yeah um and it's proven to be pretty rewarding uh professionally but personally um he is my bud it was simultaneous i, I was looking for at him for that and we made it work yeah, you probably got with IT and like had them send the notice like to his email and yeah. made it look like, you right. know, it was everybody. Well, it was a bit actually it was a big move for him because it was kind of a step back, but it was also kind of a step forward because of the ability to get some clinical hours. So right. it was kind of a step back in the role, but it was like one step back for five steps forward. Yeah. Well, I'd say it's worked because mm -hmm. From my experience, you know, I've been here at Cumberland for five years in August next month, which is why I was flown yeah. by. And I've gotten to know y'all. Yeah. yeah. Ah. <laughs> Wild, right? I've gotten to know you two yeah. really well and see firsthand just the quality of the work um, and your ability to create an atmosphere of recovery for the young men yeah. and the extended care patients that choose Cumberland Heights for those solutions in their life. And um, just my hat's off to you. I, I have a lot of respect for y'all's ability to create those spaces. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I knew when I, I came here in 2008, I was um, I was living in Lexington and I had been sober for a couple of years and I was working at a, I was working for a jail uh, in a treatment wing. Uh, and I came down here uh, to visit my mom who's been living here forever because um, I wanted my son to come visit uh, his grandma. And I just came out here for, um, because we had to go to a Walmart, which is right down the road. I was like, I'm going to go down there and fill out an application. Basically got hired on the spot, and I've been here ever since. I started in adolescent, which was something that I wasn't really um, familiar with, but I just, like, fell in love with that because working with these the, the adolescents uh, was very rewarding. And then um, just kind of moved into young men's, which was kind of my niche. I, I really uh, like that. Yeah. So I have a question for y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's it like? What's it like in your positions? Y'all are so involved in every, really, you know, your director of milieu management, which we could talk about what that means, because that's actually new for Cumberland Heights, specifically River Road. You know, new director of the Young Men's Program and Extended Care. Y'all worked together for a long time, but y'all are so involved. The other day, Christina and I were uh, doing something in the courtyard, actually, with y'all, and there was a code blue called for mm -hmm. a patient. Yeah. And it was really cool to see everybody kind of just jump up, staff from all over the campus go to where this incident was happening with a patient. And so I've been thinking about how involved you guys are with 
daily census meetings, treatment plan reviews, everything from from case management, admissions, medical, and beyond. So Mm -hmm. what's it like day-to-day working in a residential addiction treatment center? Well, there's a lot going on. I mean, you just, (laughs) I I don't know. I mean, I I guess when when you started talking about that, what initially popped into my mind was that at least for Travis and I both, I mean, we, I didn't apply for a clinical director position at Cumberland Heights. You know, this was just an opportunity to try something different. And so we've both sort of started at the, at the beginning. And, and so when a, when a code blue is called, there's still this part of you that knows you just go. And now granted, that's yeah. a part of our job, but it was also something that was a part of my responsibilities when I first started here. And, yeah. and so I think that what it's like being in, in this position is, is it's just a culmination of all of those roles. Um, and just being mindful, if, if anything, it's a little bit difficult for me in that I am to trust the team to, to do those things yeah. or I, it, it's maybe not as hands-on as it has been. And so it's not always going to that situation, but it's knowing the people that you can involve in that situation. It's thinking globally about the about the dif- different departments, different programs, different patient dynamics, um, but it but it is it's it's um, it's prioritizing and and considering the the best strategy and and really who can, who can who is it that needs to be front lines for that situation and so for for me as a new director I guess what I'm saying is that um, I'm learning how to step back which is new which is newer for me and um, be involved, but be involved in a different way, which does look like mm. census and so more of the, the global meetings, gathering that information and disseminating it. Yeah, I would agree. And having said that, coming up from a CA to a CA team lead to a case manager, counselor, coordinator, director, coming up through all those roles, I take a little piece of each one of those things with me even as I move on. Um, but... First and foremost is patient care. So if there's like, if we hear a code, like especially a code blue, because that's rare, we know there's a patient in trouble. So it doesn't matter what we're doing, we got to go deal with that, regardless of what level we're at. Um, or like if there's a code red, like a fire or something. Um, now maybe some of the other things, but still that's those are still pieces of what we do. Um, and so they kind of transition to the next level of, or role. Yeah. I'm also curious for us to boil this down even further to what's it like for a patient here every day? Because I, I think uh, something that's been interesting about this show is we've gotten a fair amount of listeners that have nothing. They have no insight in treatment at all, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe um, they've some yeah. introduced into behavioral health lightly. Maybe they're working in private practice, a family member. So it's interesting. Uh, I'm really used to this environment. Yeah, you know, sure. having been a former patient myself mm-hmm. and worked at a couple of facilities like this, so from y'all's perspective, you know, what's it like? Well, I think the goal is to not disrupt their normal daily life as much as possible with them being in a residential setting, um, and and for them to feel comfortable. And for each person, it's different, you know, because I mean, detox is different for each. Um, drug if it's alcohol or methamphetamines or it, it's different and, and so we initially try to make them as comfortable as possible and I think on the front end building rapport with the patient so they can trust us and and believe in what we're doing is super important um, so we try to mimic a lot of real life situations I mean they still have to go to group so have to handle stuff outside sometimes, which is our case managers do a great job with that and mm-hmm. counselors do a great job with that. But we try to make it as comfortable as possible for them. You know, they got good food. They got a good bed to sleep in. The safety piece is kind of first so they feel safe. And, and once we get them there, then they can kind of open up and talk to us a little bit about what's going on with them in their life. Not just the drugs, not the drugs and alcohol. I mean, they're doing drugs and alcohol for a reason. You know, that's we want to get to that. Like, what's really going on with you? Um, and if you, they don't trust you, they're not going to They're not gonna open mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, I think the safety of the patients and um, building trust is, like, the very first thing we kind of go with with them. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about how, well, you hear about the bubble 
all the time, you know, and, and it's a microcosm. Of and I don't necessarily like the bubble because real things can happen while someone's in treatment. Right. right. And so there's this idea that, well, someone is safer maybe in treatment for the, for the most part than they are outside of treatment, you know, um, and, um, it's not a bubble, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a buffer. Maybe it's a place to be able to slow down or in yeah. some ways a magnifying glass. Sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. You don't have your best friend anymore. Right. Like right. you're like, we're going exactly. to ask tough questions. You know, it's, un, it's uncomfortable emotionally. Certainly. Sure. It and can who, be. Who am I now? Right. right. Like, like how do I show, especially in how the does young, my identity shift? Young, young man's, man's program. I'm 18 to 26 year old, you know, You've, I've taken away a part of my identity. Right. Yeah. Right. And so how do I belong to this community? You know, I mean, I think we see a lot of guys who are, who really want to do this thing. Right. I can think back to me, like I really wanted to get sober. Um, and then you put me around some, some guys and was it safe for me to want to be that guy or was I going to be ostracized? Right. And so I think mm. when I think about residential treatment from the young men's perspective is that I think we're trying to create an atmosphere where it's, it's not so rigid, you know, I mean, it's not like change everything, right? Like we hear this all the time, change everything, right? And there's a component of that, but I think at the same time, we try to give them an opportunity to be themselves and to foster this um, safety in the community where, sure, we want them to be safe with us. I mean, I think that's a given, but how safe is it when we're not around? You know, what's it look like at the lunch table? Yeah. What's it look like in the cabin at night? Is it okay to, to go, hey man, I was struggling, I was craving today or I've just been feeling down or this idea of going to Stillwaters or extended care after treatment and being away from my family, girlfriend, school, career for 30 more days is, is scary. Is it okay to bring that up or do I have to be, do I still have to play that role? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, that's, that's what I see. That's, that's maybe what I see it looking like in residential treatment. And there's this thing that happens when we do it right. Oh, you know, yeah. And you can speak to it if you want. When we you know. get a, when we get a good group, man, it is. When we got guys stepping up being leaders, we've created roles in our community in young men's specifically. They have they have roles um, where they kind of have ownership in their community. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll talk to them. The most important time to talk to them about the community is when the community is going good. Mm -hmm. You got to reinforce. You got to say, "Hey, man, you guys are doing good." You guys are doing good. Just keep this up. Let's keep it. Almost like a coaching. I, I kind of come from that mm -hmm. that perspective is you got to keep this up. One guy can come in here. We'll drop one guy in here, change the whole dynamic of the community. We mm -hmm. don't want that to happen. You guys keep it up. You guys change his mindset instead of him changing yours. We want to keep this community going well. Uh, and so, like, coaching them when things are going good. I know that whenever I was, whenever I had relapsed, it wasn't really when things were going bad for me. It was mm -hmm. when things were going good. You know, I think, oh, I think I got this thing. And then next thing you know, mm -hmm. life happens. Life sure. knocks on the door. But, you know, I think that that piece, when we have our community going well, we have our, our um, mayor in the community holding these people accountable and holding their peers accountable and everybody stepping up and identifying uh, character defects and shortcomings or whatever or incidents in the community, it's it's great. It's a wonderful thing to see. You know, um, mm -hmm. that that's what gets me fired up, you know, because yeah. you have a whole group of these young men, you know, wanting to change their lives and taking direction. It's, it's great. It's contagious. It's contagious. Mm -hmm. it reminds me of Stillwaters. Sure. Yeah. You exactly. know, like the commitment that that community has to, and we, we use words like accountability. I want to be careful because like, I think to us, to me, it makes a lot of sense, you know, but yeah. Sometimes right. I worried about like the rigidity of that word, yeah. kind of like, you know, some lesson that your uncle taught you when you were five that you never forget. Right. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but really it's love, yeah. you know, loving each other as kind of strangers. Cause I met you three weeks ago or, or, sure. or six weeks ago or whatever to say, Hey, like I'm worried about you. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, kind of beginning to grease those wheels of even having experience to have those conversations. Right. Cause I think y'all would say, these guys, for the most part, don't have those type of conversations with each other. Period. Sure. And that's not a, it's not a, it's not a male thing. It's not a, 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 a woman thing. You know, yeah. not, that, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not unique to any one individual, right? That's just the sure. human condition of I'm going to protect myself because I'm scared or I'm lonely or whatever's happening within me. So, um, it sounds like an exciting environment to fan the flame. Sure. Of early recovery. Yeah. 
which an, uh, I'm curious about from y'all's perspective and your experience, how change really starts to take root with these guys. I think we're talking about it. Y you know, I mean, sorry, but I do. I know. Let it rip. I think that's what we're talking about. Though. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess I believe in the program. I believe in us. I believe in the, the, the programming that we build. And yet um, it happens in the community. You know, change happens when it's safe to change. Um, ultimately, um, when it's OK for me to want this thing around my peers, because we can be seen as the good guy or the bad guy. Um, and I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Either. I'll play the role. Whatever's best for the community or for that individual. Because sometimes people say, you know, change is um, motivated to manufacture around pain when the pain's great enough. Yeah. But pain, I mean, what's the tolerance, right? I mean, we're talking about. And what does a, that look like? We're talking about uh, a landscape right now where fentanyl is killing people. I mean, like, drug use has changed. You know, I mean, it, it's just, it's different, right? Uh, the big book was written for last gaspers, you, you know, and now we're seeing uh, people showing up and I've been using fentanyl for nine months and I've overdosed five times. Yeah. And I didn't even know what I was buying. Okay. I, I just mean like, I think that's a dangerous thing to play around with is pain, right? Um, bottoms, everything. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that a bottom is something that happens here, not out there. You know, um, I think a bottom is admitted in the first step. You know, I and I think that bottom is, is rooted in honesty, is rooted in truth. And that bottom is simply that if I really have this thing, then I'm capable of doing it again. That's it. Where does that take me? I don't know. But we can, we can create levels of pain threshold. We can dig deeper. I mean, we can play. We can use all those cliches. But at the end of the day, I think that if we can – and that's why I love the Young Men's Program. I mean, Nick, you and I, we both got sober young. I mean, even you, right? Um, kind of. Bro, kind of. you're young. You're you young. know, young, I mean, young, like, young, young, I got sober good, at 29. That's, but at 22 well, years old, I thought – I'm 18 years sober. You're, I know you're beautiful. <laughs> At 22 years old, I had this, I, I, you know, I, I showed up to treatment the first time and I thought I was ready. Mm. And then I started hearing all these stories and that was my benchmark. Mm. You know, I hadn't. Right. I mean, I've never been, I've never been arrested. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I ultimately, like if I tell my like, story, am I sick enough to be cool. here? You know I'm not, I mean? yeah. yeah. Nobody's going to yeah. like put my story yeah. on YouTube. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. it's kind of lame, but it, but it hurt. It hurt. It hurt enough, right? But I showed up, and I thought that you know nobody helped me recognize that it wasn't uh, it wasn't the things that occurred, right? This idea of unmanageability being an internal sort of thing rather than an external, right? You know, jail, losing your job, all those things are those really? Is that really unmanageability, or is that just a a, a symptom of powerlessness? I love that so much, and I think it's something that we don't talk about enough. Is just again uh, how love. And, and not to be woo woo, but you know, really, uh, brotherly love. You know, the spiritual sure. principle. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know what it reminds me of? This is a bit tangential, but y'all will completely understand. It's it's the interesting dynamic between um, uh, MAT mm -hmm. and our recovery communities over the last fifteen years. Yeah, sure. I was yeah. just talking about this with buddies uh, earlier this week at a retreat. You know, somebody was asking me. You know, uh, when you work in this field long enough, y'all can relate to this. Somebody comes to you with like all the questions. <laughs> you know, like, what do you think about it? And I'm like, well, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> this right. is what the data say. And this has been my personal and professional experience. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's that um, the, in a certain time period, I went to a lot of meetings where a lot of people were getting shut down. Sure. Yeah. And I understand their perspective of wanting to protect this, that, or the other. But I don't understand not being able to just show people hey, everybody's welcome. And sometimes we forget that the only requirement outside of a treatment setting in a recovery, in a traditional recovery mm -hmm, setting sure. is a desire. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just a desire to change, yeah, right? Absolutely. And, and it reminds me of what you're talking about. It's like, it's not about the pain. It's not about being sick enough. It's not about having the biggest and baddest bottom. Mm -hmm. It's about how that community can rally around you and say, we're going to love you till you can love yourself. Absolutely. You know, and we're going to try to teach you how to live these principles in your daily affairs. And like you're talking about, that's what was transformational with me mm -hmm. was the currency of beginning to negotiate change within me with people that were doing recovery. Yeah. That, yeah. that thing has happened before this. It, it has it happened with As antidepressants yeah. and, you know, and that, 
we need to continue to evolve and grow. Yeah. You know? And I know that Bill and Bob had that conversation. Yeah. You know, and so uh, I think we need to stay open minded. You know, I, I, there's the you can't treat a dead patient and all that. You know, you, get, you guys got to stay alive. I get all that, you know, and um, I think it's individual. I think especially what we do here, our treatment plans are individual. We work with individuals. Um, the overall arching thing is what we want them to have is a happy, healthy, whole, successful life. Um, and it looks different for each person. But the big umbrella of it is we want them to be alive and be happy. You know, but there's different paths for different people. And there's the data. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm just, um, I guess I'm thinking about, ch I don't like change maybe as much as hope, right? Um, and, and I guess just what I'm, what I'm reflecting on just kind of while, while you all are talking is that if the only requirement is a desire to stop. Um, and I'm thinking about who we get and who, you know, who comes to treatment, who, who checks into treatment. Oftentimes someone does not admit to treatment um, abstinent, right? They're under the influence. And, the, and, and uh, my, my experience, you know, at w working with others and personally is that um, at the end of this thing, all that drugs and alcohol do for me is help me see that I can't use drugs and alcohol anymore. So I have this extreme desire to stop. And then the next day when I wake up without that power, let's say, and I'm utterly powerless, I don't have enough courage to even recognize that I can't do this. Right. Yeah. And so, so, um, what I need is that community. What I need is hope. Right. And, and, and I think that that hope comes from the guy who maybe comes to my bed at medical and says, what's up, man. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name's Jeff. I've been here for 13 days. Do you know where the lunchroom is? Let's, let's go get something to eat. You know, hey, we got group at one. Right. I want you to come with me. Do you smoke? You know what I mean? Like, that's where it happens, right? Yeah. It's that that hope that's handed back, right? Like, I think that's our greatest tool at Cumberland Heights is that we have a medical detox unit. Because after day 21, I might be a little overconfident. I might have forgotten already what it was like before I got here. Yeah. But if I just take a stroll down and go meet the guy that just got here, that was convinced yesterday he needed to be here and convinced he needs to leave today. Right. And I go, oh, yeah. I had like, that was 21 days ago. That's what, that's what it was like. You know, that's a, and, and again, that's a, that's from someone else. It's, it's always going to have to involve that other person. We're quick forgetters. I, yeah, we are. <laughs> and it, it sort of reminds me of, um, there's a moment in recovery, I think for, for a lot of people, when we stop running away from the behavior, we stop running away from the habit, we stop running away from the drugs and alcohol, we start running towards recovery. Right. Sure. It is a, there is a shift. That's a different you know? thing. Yeah. And, uh, what I love, you know, you guys haven't talked, like we haven't talked a lot today about like the, the, the details of use and abuse sure. and the lifestyle that goes along with that because the solution <clears throat> and the environment that we create in a treatment setting really has very little to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly there's a commitment to abstinence, but like there is an up and down road with craving and maybe using dreams in your experience or maybe going back to where you're from and getting reminded and driving sure. on this and seeing all the same people, places and things as we call them. But mm -hmm. really it's about that community process that'll invite you mm -hmm. yeah. to ask bigger questions of yourself in order to change over time. Sure. You know, the, yeah. the, the from to two thing is, is really, uh, that's here. And it's reframing, I think. We try to do that. Like, I, that's the I only have to go to meetings till I want to go to meetings. Yeah. You know, it's just that it's not, it is a shift, but it's not a as big of a shift as people think. You know, it's, it's, we try to show that to them too. We try to, to reframe some of their thinking for them um, so they can see it in that way. You know, they're, they're running from the wave. You know, and all this stuff is chasing them, all this stuff outside of here, all my bills and all the the dope man and all the, you know, the stuff I did. And they're just running. And the waves, get, we say, dude, just stop. Let it hit you. It's not going to kill you. And, and once once that happens and then they, they, they can see some or have some resilience, you know, build some of that, then then they're able to to move a little bit more, you know, instead of be it being 
running from it and more to it. Do you guys, um, I'm 33, Jeff, you're 33, Mm -hmm. you're 35, Travis is 35, 38-ish. I am, you know how old I am? How old? How do you think I am? Let's see. It's like the price is right, 41. Very close. I am 47 years old. You're a young 47. Young 47, brother. Super young. I'm I'm really curious about how um, people struggling with addiction have maybe changed or not changed. So you mentioned the Genesis of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Like this place, we just celebrated Founders Day on the 25th, right? Mm-hmm. 57 years started with three male patients treating, quote, alcoholism, treating addiction, right? But um, And then I remember coming to Cumberland Heights uh, as a patient here 13 years ago and the commonalities of my story with other people specifically related to opioids. Mm -hmm. And now there's this thing, fentanyl, right? That we end up talking about a lot because a lot of our patients are really experiencing the negative effects of that really awful, tragic drug. Yeah. Um, And then we're starting to, the Youngman's program also starting to treat a different generation. Sure. You know, (laughs) no more millennials, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you guys have any interesting insights about that change? I know Travis does. He's he loves he yeah. loves his to topic. talk about this. He has a PowerPoint and everything. I actually do. I know you do. I do have on. Um, well, it's not my PowerPoint, but it's one I saw at a training that I loved. It was talking about gen- like the changing generation. Um, yeah, it's. I don't. Yeah, I, I hear. I I can sense you're not wanting to be. Um, I want to be kind. And loving, yeah. But there's a there's a, a a laziness or a lack of motivation in the uh, the the generation. In in a lot of things, um, there's um, it's anhedonic. And is that a word? Anhedonia. Uh-huh. It's like an, it's like they cease. But anhedonic itself. Anodonic. I don't know if that's a word. I just made that up. It's anhedonia. Esk. DSM they, five. What? We're gonna put in the DSM. That's fine. Put in the five. DSM five. Okay. Um, they they just like when I was coming up, it was like I can't wait to get my driver's license. I can't wait to turn eighteen and move out. There's not a lot of that oomph in a, in this generation now. Um, it's everybody wants to be a YouTube star and make millions of dollars doing that and don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to work like they don't want to have like a they don't want to go to school college, which is where the which was one of the my favorite things about working with young men's was getting involved with collegiate recovery. Yeah, it's it's just a lack of motivation. Uh, not everybody, but it's a, it's a lot more than it used to be. And I don't know if it's um, I don't know why that is. Is it just the, the world itself? Is it the drugs? Is it the change in Substances, because I think it's not just um, people that suffer from alcohol and drug addiction. Um, but then you have um, stop. That's just what I, I've seen. It's it's it is um, it's a struggle. Yeah. Um, I also have a. Let 16, me just say this. I have a this seems kid. like a really hard question. It is. Yeah. Well, because which is be- why we're gonna stay on it. Well, <laughs> and I guess I would just try to be nice. I have a different okay. perspective than that. And maybe it's just that. Yeah, let it rip. I don't, I don't know um, that Travis is 35 and I'm 33. Um, but for me, what I think that I see it, it, more characteristic um, is just simply that social media takes a much larger. It's, it's much more important to I in know. these individuals lives. I agree. Um, and, and a lot of life happens on a phone um, than when I was growing up, than when your generation was growing up. Then I mean, I just think that more and more is happening in front of a screen. Yeah. Which we can get weird and Andrew Huberman, <laughs> the effects of whatever, I don't even know how to talk about, but like looking at a screen right when you wake up and all of, I mean, it's just, you know, so there's probably something that speaks to that. But I think the, that, that there's also, like if I was getting picked on at school when I got off at the bus, that wasn't coming with me. 
nowadays it's it's again it's right here in front of me that's really interesting and so all I the time think that there is a, that's an really increase of mental health that's occurring you know like and again you know i can't speak to it in any way that's um what i just mean is i would i feel like we're seeing our young men's population show up with i mean everyone seems to have depression anxiety and of Every- course these things correlate with mm-hmm. substance use disorder but i just feel that it is at a higher level and it's it's maybe a little bit different depression and anxiety than we're talking about just because it's right there in my pocket it's just i'm constantly it's hard to have a safe space with, yes when it's sure all the time i remember uh leaving treatment and turning my phone back on sure yeah. and just like you know oh that's what you just did I, well see i was gonna say I, I, I like to pretend that it like i had 100 notifications yeah. but i had maybe like three or i had one voicemail and it was from my mom asking if my phone was turned back on and it was like <laughs> three months prior yeah but i went to sober living and didn't have a phone either for uh i had, didn't have a phone for like well 10 months. you know this was 2010 so mm-hmm. like wherever social media was there, it wasn't where it is now, certainly. Sure. Um, I mean, some many of the platforms didn't even exist. Some were just getting kicked off. But I remember feeling the pull. Mm-hmm. That's what I'll say. I remember feeling this yeah. pull mm-hmm. toward notifications, this pull toward, sure. you know, uh, what my friends had been doing on social media right, right, and right, like right, right. looking back yeah. through that history. And so... Maybe another way to say what you guys are describing is that cu- our culture has changed. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Over the last 15 years. Right. You know, in a significant way. Sure. And we need to be, as an organization, this is my opinion, we need to be wide-eyed about that. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, um, and how we have conversations with patients about their, I don't even know what to call it, but their social identity sure. or their digital identity. Um, we need to be wide-eyed with the risks. Because, you know, the risk for a patient that we're all very familiar with is the day you leave. Sure. You know, whether you're going to an IOP or going back home to like pack up some more of your clothes, like that's, that's the tension point, Mm -hmm. right? Where, where a decision can be made and I can't even hold it against somebody because it's hard. You know, you're just battling up against that system of normality, right? You're used to these thought patterns. You're used to these behaviors and you put somebody back in their environment, back at home, man, that's the oh, biggest yeah. risk for them actually getting back in the car right. and making it out to Stillwaters or the aftercare house or whatever. Sure. So maybe our culture has changed. And how are we, through y'all's eyes, adapting our programming and our discussions with our patients to make sure that we're decreasing that risk yeah. of their social identity while they're here? So in our extended care program, they have their cell phones. Yeah. Um, so you, do you give them to them right when they leave here? Yeah. 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 And and it's not just like, here's your phone, do it. I mean, there's, there's guidelines around it, but, and, and, it, and it's not um, something they have in their pocket during groups or no, anything yeah. like that. We, we, they turn it in and, and really um, maybe it was like a wild idea. You know, I think some people, when I, um, I heavily, when you were the director and I was just the counselor in extended care, heavily advocated for them just having their phones. There were yes, these built in phone times. Um, it just made sense for them to be adults and to, and, um, we kind of just did, we just kind of just did it. But what I'm saying though, is that, (laughs) um, the, the thinking around that is that I kind of want to know who's going to isolate from the community all of a sudden, because they have their phone. Cause we kind of want to, I kind of want to know who feels like they're missing out before they're miss. you know, you do look at that. Then we can then we can work with it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I just want to see. Are any conversations happening here in the young re- program in residential? Mm-hmm. Um, or yeah, the men's well, program, the women's program, whatever. Well, they they don't get their phones as much. They st- you know because and that was a big change. COVID changed a lot too. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. and that was a big a lot of changes and a rough time for everybody. But um, we now do uh, virtual visitation. And they're allowed to have their phones during that time. They are not supposed to buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon and have it shipped here. They're not supposed to do those things. And for the most part, they don't. We we monitor their um, their visitation, but um, sometimes they will. We've had we've had a guy slip us his phone case back and turn it back in, and the phone not be in the case, right? You know, or because uh, he wants to talk to his girlfriend at night or whatever. Or he wants to 
check everybody out on Facebook or on the gram, you know. So last year um we do and when that happens, we treatment plan around that. Yeah. You know, we talk to them about what principle is this and yeah. the dishonesty and the sneakiness and the old behavior stuff and when when what's interesting what need too is you, you know, fulfilling. They're, they're not supposed to be they're supposed to be making FaceTime phone calls to mm-hmm. family. But they don't want to. They yeah. just want to text. You know, and so that's where a lot of our really? work is around. Yeah, it's like it's oh, not yeah. for Facebook. It's not for but majority of the time, you know, there's you know, that's where we have to sort of work around guidelines and really encouraging this is a virtual visitation time, not just So um do y'all know Stefan Bate, Jay Walker? Um, no. I think you do. I'm familiar with Jay Walker. I think I He's their clinical director. I think I okay. met him. Yeah, you've yeah. met him. Uh, I was at an event with him last year as a side, and uh, we were talking about social. We were talking about this. Mm-hmm. We were talking about social media and the impact it has on our patient populations. And, sure. You know, just given my background with research and uh, the yeah. other things that I do for Cumberland Heights on a day to day basis, we were talking about um, trying to understand more of the impact that it's having on our patients, and and so through this kind of anecdotal conversation, he's like, well, let me tell you this. He's like, we've been. Because they have a um, primary program and a forgive, – forgive me, shout out Jay Walker. Forgive me, Bobby. <laughs> uh, I don't know the language of their different programs, but that step-down aftercare program that they have, sure. um, they give their phones back. Mm-hmm. They might have them the whole time, but they have them you know, full-time at that point. And they were monitoring by hand, which I thought was interesting. The clinical team was monitoring the um, – you know when you get that really depressing notification on Sunday sure. about your um, – you Screen know, t- time. Your screen time. Yeah. Yeah. So they were monitoring screen time every week with every patient, just like writing down what that number is, how many Mm -hmm. hours it was or whatever. And what he was telling me anecdotally is that he was seeing, you know, just a case at a time, if you will, uh, that the guys that were isolating and had these really exponential screen time numbers Mm -hmm. were doing worse in the community than those with not. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, Which kind of is like, well... Of course, yeah. of course it would be that way, but it is kind of a monumental idea uh, to think about how to support people in this new culture that we live in through right. having direct conversations about, hey, does everybody realize how they feel sometimes when they log on to Instagram? Right. And you see somebody else getting engaged yeah. On a beach oh, somewhere yeah. with no shoes yeah. or whatever. In Hawaii. Or uh, like, you know, sitting courtside okay. yeah. at a Grizzlies game or who, who cares? Fill in the right. blank for you. But it has a large mm-hmm. yeah. s- pull on yeah. our lives. Even just likes. You, I mean, you know, just the the feel good that comes from how many people like like me. Yeah. Right? I mean, like that's really what it's saying, you know, and but but yeah, I, I agree that. I think we need to be having more conversations with our patients about it. Agreed. To be frank, we well, can't just take it away, right? And then just give it back, right? You know, and because and we're talking about life skills, about changing your phone number yeah, to re- your drug dealer, and all this kind recovery, of stuff. Recovery, like, recovery is about is about this, mm-hmm. and it's and and everyone here, you know, it's about it's about absolutely. That. But as soon as I as soon as I pick that thing up, it's about this, and all that goes away. Absolutely, all that goes away for me, and then I'm I'm here, and then and it happens in the community on Wednesdays and Sundays and sure Mondays, Wednesdays and Sundays for that period of time. Now, if they're doing what they're supposed to do, it's it's not as bad, you know, they're but if they're just scrolling or whatever, they're just there's opportunity for for this to happen and yeah. it do, it doesn't. And learning to well, again, it's a it's a tool. We all use it as a tool and and so I mean as much as it can isolate it can also connect me to my sponsor on a regular basis. That Person True. I'm texting, uh, you, you know, again, so how can we reframe that? It's it's not because, again, even the data that we see, the individual in the community who has more screen, tri- more screen time is more isolated, usually struggling. Again, how can we flip that screen time and use it to our advantage, right? Um, like in extended care, we, I want them to have their phone so that when you call, you know, when I was in treatment, if I called my sponsor and he didn't answer, he couldn't call me back. Right. You know, leave right. a message. We're doing messages back and forth. And I already don't know how to do this. So I'm like, hey, uh, it's me, Jeff. Everything is good, I think. And um, I completed my, se- you know, I don't know what I'm, I don't uh, know. But yeah. I get to have this more, this more real experience with um, that. We've had guys in extended care who sponsor 
introduces them to the sponsor tr sponsee tree and they all send a 10 and 11th step at night and they get added to it. And so they're already connected to seven guys who are checking in. Yeah. And they, cr and so all of a sudden we've already put out these, 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 um, you know, their, their community is growing. And, and so again, I think we've been talking about community and this tool, right. Can be used to either keep me, keep me away, or it can also be used as a way to help me embrace this process. You yeah. Know? It's just a tool that we got to yeah. get with, 100%. you know, we got, we yeah. got a, um, that we didn't have, Agreed. you know, when so I, it's been interesting to see how our programs have just kind of adapted, mm -hmm. uh, mid air. When I saw sure. all those people that went yeah. on that alumni, uh, trip, the, canoe, the canoe trip. Yeah. I was like, dang, yeah. Oh man, I wish I would have went to that. Yeah. You know, so that's, that makes me think next time, you know what, yeah. next time I'm going to go to that, you know, yeah. I'm going to, mm -hmm. th th that looked like they had a great time. Yeah. You know, so I think if, if we can inundate it with more positivity, then sure. It could be used positively. It could yeah. be a good tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, let me pivot a little bit. Um, in y'all's roles in Cumberland, just maybe as an organization, where do you see us going? What's next? Mars. <laughs> I see it. I I.O.P. on Mars. I.O.P. on Mars. Yeah. You heard it here first. You heard it here first, yeah. folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, what do we need to get better at? Attend? What, what do we need? Look, we do a lot, and I want to be careful about this. Yeah. We do a rot, lot really well. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I love working for a place that's, hey, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, yeah. let's effectively treat people like we know mm -hmm. how to do. Let's not be, let's not have our blind spots. Like, yeah. let's hold each other accountable. Let's make sure not, we're not deceiving ourselves. Let's improve our programs. Let's invest in our staff. Right. You, you know what I would like to see? I was watching quarterback the other day. You know what I'm going to say? I don't. Kirk, I, I, Kirk I honestly do not know what you're gonna say. <laughs> okay, you did, you're not watching a quarterback that we need a football on field? Netflix. No, but they're they're you know they're looking at these three quarterbacks. But they're watching throughout the season. Kurt um, Cousins, yeah, is doing brain spotting. He's doing brain mapping, and mm -hmm. uh, it's very important for my role as a quarterback. Whatever, but it was it was super um, interesting to me. Oh God, I got sucked into that piece of uh, of the show and what they were doing. Um, cause I, I mean, it was talked about, it wasn't explained thoroughly cause it was him and his wife talking about it. Right. But they were talking about the benefits of it and how much it's helped him and his wife. Um, so I, I mean, I think that would be something that would be cool for us to look into. Um, you know, we're, we are expanding a bit and we're looking a little more into doing some co-occurring stuff and getting over in that area more. Um, which I think is beneficial with culture change too, and with the patients changing and the patients being so complex, um, which is, is I think is a super important. Um, one thing that I think we should not do is stop changing, like stop growing. I think that because then you get stagnant, and then I mean we got to roll with the, um, the changes in the world. Um, but I think that would be interesting to uh, something that we could bring. I like that we're gonna have um, IOP back on this campus. That's exciting for me. It feels like we're getting back to some of the normal stuff pre-COVID. So that's exciting. I've always felt like that that River Road is the mothership. You know, we have all these extensions, all these other places, and um, you know, keeping the mothership here, you know, healthy and intact has been. The, the number one goal because it keeps everything, it feeds everything else. Um, so bringing IOP back here on campus is super exciting for me. Um, so, so I have to say about that. But I, the brain mapping stuff was very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to learn more about that. Jeff, what do you think? Well, I just want to talk about extended care, <laughs> which I feel like I shouldn't do. do. But um, he has a lot of ideas. Well, I just think that's, to me, I think that um, we have some wonderful programs that aren't IOP and aren't residential treatment. And, yes, and so, we do. Yeah, yeah. and so I just, um, to me, I, I just want to invest in, in that as much as we can. You know, um, we are 
you know, we rolled out a 90 day continuum of care, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we've been, I think, pretty successful with that. Um, and during that time, um, we've been able to just be successful w with almost meeting that 90 day continuum of care before someone's even left our campus with extended care. And, and I just think about um, the opportunities moving forward to grow something like that, which is less of a buffer, again, between um, real life and residential treatment, you mm -hmm. know, and um, well, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm just crazy, but there's college, there's, there's, I mean, there's just all yeah. kinds of there's things everything. that can, yeah. everything that can occur while, you know, it's sort of just blending these. Let me ask components. you this. Yeah. I was having lunch with Joey Darby. Mm -hmm. Great guy. Love Joey Darby. Yeah. Shout out Joey. Didgeridoo. Didgeridoo. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, so, if you want the real experience of Joey Darby, ask him to hit the dig in yeah. the his office. Yes. Um, he was asking me at lunch and we were kind of having, you know, we were just, as we do, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, dreaming big about different things. But one thing that he asked me is, Nick, do you think that there's ever a case where a patient is just done with treatment once they get completed at residential? Do you guys understand the question? Sure. Yeah. And I'll ask y'all. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I think that we have, I think there's um, time to move on to a, the sure. new phase of your development. Absolutely. Right. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is, because when you're talking about extended care, like we've been focused a lot sure. yeah. over the past maybe two years mm -hmm. on making sure that our programs are accessible for any patient along their treatment journey, sure. as we like to describe it here, right? So not being so focused on detox and residential and IOP, but like remembering and trying to empower, like, no, no, we have a, we have a beautiful extended care program. We have a great Stillwaters men and women's program. Mm -hmm. We have Arch Academy now for adolescent boys soon. Yeah. Next year, we're going to have a girls facility right. nice. for adolescent right. girls, which we're really excited about. So, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, him and I were just, you know, it's probably if we had it our way with every case, we wouldn't just stop a patient after a residential experience. Sure. We would want them to continue yeah. to have an aftercare experience or a Stillwater experience yeah. or an IOP experience. And even beyond that, yeah, to be involved either as a volunteer or in our um, – uh, traditional aftercare programs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I was just curious about y'all's opinion on that because we do have a lot of patients that stop. Sure. We make the referrals and they stop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Travis. It's sometimes I think that, you, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to take into account the patient, the client that we're working with, you know, and I think um, sometimes it's, beneficial to sort of meet them in the, you know, sometimes I think it's beneficial for a young men's patient to do, to go to the young men's program for 20 days and they're willing to go to Stillwaters on day 20, but maybe, you know, just 50 days. Sure. You know, you know, like, so, uh, and, um, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking about how often I'm asked that question, not by Nick or Joey, but sitting with someone going, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore or, well, or I'm bored, you know, kind of. And, and, um, to me that's almost, well, uh, what did you speak to earlier? Right? Like when do I move into, or I can't remember how you phrased it, but this idea of running towards recovery. Yeah. Like that's where I think it's, um, it's not just, I'm, you're either right. One or the other. And so I think the work continues yeah. regardless, no matter what. Now, what that works lo looks like, I think is that's where we get to Get creative. There also is a there's a threshold of when you you leave treatment and enter recovery. You know, it's it's not like uh, I'm a recovering person. I'm not in treatment, but I'm still in recovery. So I'm con I continue to do things and probably will continue to do things for my recovery and in my recovery for the rest of my life. But I'm no longer in treatment. You know. Um, I have a sense of obligation to give back to people that are still trying to get out of that for me because I was given a gift. 
you know, and a part of that, part of that is Cumberland Heights itself, why I still work here. Um, because I am a recovering addict. I am a convicted felon. I am all the, that drug addict guy that, that got sober and got his life together. And Cumberland Heights gave me an opportunity that a lot of people would not have given me. And I have a sense of, I, I owe, I owe Cumberland Heights something for that too. You know, they, um, when, when I was two years sober, uh, it still wasn't, you know, it's still not, you know, there's, I still, I still get crazy sometimes, you know, but hmm, never, just you, then. Okay. Got it. You right. know what I mean? Never seen that. Yeah. I do know what you mean. Um, but you know, I still, uh, I feel like I owe an obligation to cover in Heights for doing that. Mm-hmm. I still like, I owe Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step recovery for giving me a life that I never thought I could have. You know, I've been married to the same woman, for, God bless her, for, you know. Shout out to Gigi. Yeah, for 17 years. And my kids, my son's 16 years old, never seen me take a drink. My my daughter's 10 years old, never seen me take a drink or use drugs. You know, so I, I have a sense of obligation to the people that helped me to give back. You know, and so I don't think I'll... Yeah, I'm I'm done with treatment. I'm not in treatment anymore. Well, I work in treatment, so I'm in treatment every day. But, but I'll be in recovery for the rest of my life. You know, I that's I don't know if that answers your question, but absolutely. Yeah. What do you guys struggle with the most? <laughs> Can I tell you, Jeffrey is my best friend. So when I come to work. It's that there's a question on that on that survey about your job and your job satisfaction and da da da. And one of the questions says, "Do you have a best friend at work?" And you know what I say? Yes, I do, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, and so he helps me more than he knows. Uh, so anything that I sh- struggle with, um, I- I'm happy to have him. You know, because we, I'm not talking about just work. I'm talking about at home. Uh, I know intimate details of his life and he knows intimate details of mine and we support each other in that. So um, it's hard to say what do we struggle with when I have someone that I can lean on and help me out with stuff. Sorry to be sappy. But Dude, I love y'all. I think that's it's a, real, man. It's, I think bro. I struggle with uh, like smiling. Yeah. God, At, wait, taking you pictures. pictures. Wait this till one? you see the pictures. Um, but no, I mean, I think I struggle with a lot of things. You know, I mean, like that's not fair. <laughs> that's what true. do you struggle with? You know, that's, like, that's come a on. Tr- like, but I mean, I will say, uh, he does help me with I things. But I mean, I, I, I don't know. Can can I tell you? It's a weird thing to be a clinician, yeah. you know, and to be in personal recovery. I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. Um, like the very thing that has helped me has become a profession, which isn't fair. You, you know, like, I mean, I guess sometimes maybe I get jealous of other people because they get to just like be in recovery and go to work. Am I, am I doing too much? So, but um, yeah. I know, but, but that's a piece of it. And then there's a component of like a forgetting that I don't have the answers. And, and then at the very same time, like, how the hell did I end up here? And, you, you know, like this kind of like, are you sure, you know, that you want me to run the program? You know, and, but I mean. And oh, yet, I got that too. But, yeah. uh, you know, so like, yeah, I mean, I struggle They're with. They're going to find out about me. A, a lot of things. Um, I think we all have that a little bit. And maybe I'm putting the magnifying glass on those things. But, yeah, I, dude, I struggle. I'm a human being. You know, I mean, uh, life continues to, to happen and change and, and, and grow. Can I tell you guys what a story? What do you struggle with, Nick? Everything. Oh, you. <laughs> I mean, you know, like depending on the day, you know, sure. just about everything. Yeah. Um, but I have a, I have a scaffolding, I have a guidebook. Sure. You yeah. Know, right. And just a little experience <clears throat> that helps me. I mean, because some days I don't do it right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, some days I don't access all the tools that I've accessed in the past. How about that? Mm-hmm. And maybe I won't pick up that phone, but I will say one day I will. Mm-hmm. Maybe it might be the next day or the day after. Sure. 
And there's nothing, I was talking to a buddy um, earlier this week, there's nothing harder than like beginning to crack that door of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Just that, that, that one moment like once it's open, I'm like, ah, oh, now I'm being seen right. and I probably received some sort of validation from you or Travis and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it's that moment of, it, of, of anxiety when I'm just, oh, I right. need to talk to you about X, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. with the 13 years of not using substances to change my mood or my mind, like I still have that little, sure. Do I yeah, break you hide the that seal? well. Do I, do I want to, you know? You hide that well. Thanks. You don't, you don't yeah. <laughs> Expert level at this time, you know. You don't show it. <laughs> Let me tell you guys a fun story. Um, because this really was because of men like you, men and women that work for this program. Um, uh, my first night at Cumberland Heights, I was in detox, and it was April of 2010. And I was very cold, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah. Um, because of the. I was going yeah. through opioid withdrawal. Just to be clear, it wasn't that the AC was really cold and medical. But uh, yeah. I remember I had a buddy assigned to me, mm -hmm. and he came and checked on me, and it was around 7 o'clock, and he came in and he introduced my, him, himself to me, and he said, hey, it's time for a meeting. Yeah. And my first thought was, finally, <laughs> they know how important I am. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. God. Well, because I didn't understand the nomenclature of a meeting. Yeah. Like the only uh, the, identification I had with like a meeting is you're going like to business meeting. some kind of business oriented. <laughs> you're going to see the CEO, right? Right. Now. I was like, oh, they, th I'm the most important patient here. And now they're going to make sure that my needs are met. Mm -hmm. So and, I blank it up, meeting. you know, and he's like, come on, everybody's waiting. And I'm like, right. What kind of meeting? Everybody, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. so we go to the auditorium and I see, uh, these people sitting up front and then like all the patients like, mm -hmm. stuffed in there. And I'm like, Oh, this isn't what I, what I thought was going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, that night, because I had, because I, I, I had everything figured out already, right. Something called contempt prior to investigation. I sat in the back, yeah. yeah, you know, away from everybody. And what I was experiencing, I didn't know it was an H and I meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank God for H and I meetings. Sure. Yeah. And, um, the meeting started and you guys know how it goes. You know, the first volunteer shares and I wasn't impressed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kind of yeah, just sure. like, who is this? this the second lady shared third, fourth, fifth. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, I knew two things. One is that everybody in there was exactly like me. Mm -hmm. and this identification that I, I, yeah. I, I had never experienced. Sure. Oh, it's important. Yeah. In my life, ever. And it was, you guys, it was groundbreaking. Yeah. And the second thing was that they had somehow seemingly managed to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, I don't know if I was just utterly frightened by that realization or excited or apathetic, but it was, it was a monumental experience. Yeah. And, um... After the meeting, I, I stuck around probably to bum a cigarette off of somebody, and this guy named John B. Hmm. came up to me, and he gave me a hug, which I did not ask for, and certainly wasn't postured <laughs> yes. in order to, like, I'm here for a hug. <laughs> right. Like, I was just like, he just came up to me and bear hugged me. Mm -hmm. And I remember, after you know, after the hug, he kind of, you know, holding my shoulders. Sure. He's, hey, man, welcome. We're going to love you till you can love yourself. And what that was was the first spiritual principle that recovery gave me, like you talked about, and it was hope. Yeah. yeah. Just a tiny little bit of hope. Yeah. But I I have never forgotten that. I, I can't tell you a lot about treatment. I remember throwing the Frisbee. I remember being in group a couple times, you yeah. know. Yeah. I remember some of the relationships. I remember the food, um, some of the worksheets, you know. I remember a lot of the parent phone calls. But I'll never forget every single detail. Right. Of that first meeting. That really cracked something mm -hmm. yeah so i just want to say thank you guys Ge really genuinely um and for the thousands of other mental health professionals that are working in the field private practice treatment centers admissions call center people sure. yeah um having the hard conversations with the disease of addiction mm -hmm. you know and i i just couldn't be more grateful to be on the team with y'all absolutely you know, yeah. get to get to do what we do right yeah i mean it's a sweet cake. 
it's it's not bad. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> I I mean, that's I remember having that kind of same experience at, at, at two oh two one time and this guy was telling a story and he just kept telling this story and I was like, dang, this is like that's me. That's me. That's me. All the way up until he got sober and then his life got better. And I was like, Oh man, that, that dude is how do he do that? How does that guy he had like a tie on, you know? <laughs> Right, he, and I said, he is, his sponsor told him when you share, your and was story. confident about it. He said, when you share your yeah, story, yeah. you wear a tie. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, how did you do that? And he told me exactly how he did it. And he said, that'll get you nothing. Yeah, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Knowing it will get you nothing. Knowing how I did it is not valuable to you. Doing what I did is. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Right. Now I gotta do something. Right. I did not stay sober at that time, right. but it stuck with me. It stuck, it stuck with, with me because I was like, "Oh, yeah. I got up to this point where in that guy's life, and I want to keep going. Yeah. I got to do what he did." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't. Uh, I just. Me too, right? Um, like where this thing happened for me was here, and it wasn't anyone working here either. You know, and I'm not, and I'm not just crediting us, you yeah, know, yeah. but it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, for me, it was a volunteer, you know, yeah. I had been going to cocaine anonymous meetings and, uh, I wouldn't show up to them sober, you know, and I would open the book to the middle because I thought if you were in the middle of the big book, you were on a fifth step. So it looked like I was kind of, you know, doing some work, but it's actually stories. Um, cause I had a hard time keeping my head up, you know? Um, but during a meeting, uh, I kind of nodded out and came to, and someone was in the corner, uh, cry, an older gentleman, and he was tearful about losing his son. And uh, there were people standing around him, and, and I specifically remember him pointing across the room and saying, but Jeff, it's good to see you back. Keep coming back. Yeah. You know? And it freaked me out. You know, I was like, why does this guy even know I'm here? Why does he care about me? Name? I'm high, they know. You know, all this stuff. And I remember getting in my car and him kind of like coming up to the to the car and being like, I'll drive you home. Like, don't let what happened to my son happen to you. You know, all this stuff. And uh, I never went back, right? Because, <laughs> good God, I don't want yeah. that to happen again. People <laughs> saw me and stuff. You know, I mean, it was yeah. embarrassing. It was right. scary. It was whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I eventually um, came to Cumberland Heights like nine months later, you know. And um, I got here and I was, super, I was like high-fiving CAs and like, I'm ready. You know, like I was like, I'm in this. I got my book, like I brought my big book, you know, all that stuff. And the next day I woke up and I was like, I could have done this on my couch. Like there's no need for me to be here. And um, I was also convinced if you just stayed in medical, no one would like no one would find you. You know, I thought like if I just stayed in my room, they wouldn't know where I was. They still think that now. Yeah, but they have bed sheets. Just yeah, in we case. know where you're at. If you're thinking about this and you yeah. um, but someone came and got me. And they said, have you had breakfast yet? You know, and I was like, no. And they're like, well, you can't stay in a room. You know, you need to go get breakfast. And so I walked outside to smoke a cigarette. And that guy that was sitting in the corner just happened to be volunteering. And he was walking across the courtyard. Oh, and so I ran. Creepy. And it changed, right? It changed. Yeah, creepy. Stick around. Um, but I walked up to him and I said, what's up, old man? You know, and he said, about time you showed up. Have you had breakfast? And I said, no. You know, and he said, let's go eat. And he sat down and that man became my sponsor. Um, that man gave me the greatest truth, you know, of probably anything I've ever been given in recovery that day, eating breakfast. Um, he taught me, you know, uh, the principle of the first step and what it meant to, you know, I thought you were supposed to promise to stop. You know, I thought when I look at the, you know, I'd never really listened. And I thought that the first step meant I promise I'm never doing this again. And, uh, he asked me that day eating breakfast, are you going to get high again? You know, and I was like, of course not. <laughs> That's why I'm here. You know, like, no. And he just kind of chuckled, you know. And then I kind of caught, you know, I was like, okay, okay, I get it. Maybe. Not today. Right? I said all those things. Tomorrow. You know, I, every, everything I had learned, right, which had not worked for me. And he told me to ask him. And I asked him. And he said, yes. Left to my own devices, I will get high again. And he asked me what a crane operator does, you know. He said, operates a crane. What's an alcoholic do? What's a drug addict do? Yeah. Drinks. He said, are you an alcoholic? I said, yeah. He said, are you going to drink again? And I said, yes. And it was like a weight had been lifted off of me. Whew, finally. 
I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to make it right. Like, like it just finally I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I am. That's why we have 12 steps, not one. You know, like that's why it's not just a signed statement. Because I've done that, you know. Yeah. I've written in Bibles. I've, I mean, I've done, I've made lots of promises, right? <laughs> that day I made an admission. And I was able to make that admission because of another man, right? We admitted, right? Not me. And so I'm sitting here wondering how many volunteers are here today. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I just mean like that's that's it, right? Yeah. At Cumberland it's, Heights is as much us, but I mean think about the opportunity that it has for members of the recovery community to come out here. I, you know, I truly don't know when it's going to happen, and that's maybe the most exciting part about this process. I don't know when it's going to happen, is, is but it, I do love that van coming back home from the meeting sometimes, yeah. and the guys getting out going, dude, you know? Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, right. Is that your current sponsor now? You're talking. Uh, not anymore. Okay. Not anymore. But so but I, I mean, say, me and him are the same age, and you referred to him as old man. I was like, no, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. Well, thanks again, guys, for being here. Are we at the end? We are. Oh, I love y'all. This is the end. My only friend. Yeah, this is that's going by quick. Yeah, that was a hour and twenty minutes. I had so much more to say. We'll have you back again. Oh. Thanks for letting us hang out. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure, it's really. Thanks for supporting this. You know, mm -hmm. I think you guys understand what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Um, which is just highlight, well, it's to share mm -hmm. um, with other people about what really happens, you know, behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and a part of that is making sure that we have real team members, boots on the ground yeah. sure. that are part of that. So just, right. I know y'all are busy. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I love sure. this. I've, and I've watched every single one. I think they're all great. You're doing a great Thank job. Thank you. Thank the team's you. doing a great job. Yeah, and it's really the it's really the team. You know, it's that really team Ryan and Starla and Christina and Stacy. And, yeah, and all of them. So, anyways, thank thanks. you. Thank you thank for you. having us. See y'all next time. See yeah. you next time.